session, which will be preceded by lively and entertaining and insightful um, presentations. Our first one is um, by Matthew Lindemann, and he's currently at Winona State, and he'll be talking about divergent paths, context, and opportunity in the lives of 348ers. And he actually has a work for connection after he graduated. Um, he was working on a master's at that time? Or a master's in history and teaching German. Yeah, yeah, master's in history. And he actually taught German here at Wartburg for no, a few years. Not Wartburg, Wave of the Shower. Oh, Wave of the Shower. I'm sorry. But in the town, they're connected as well. Um, and actually, he and I have a connection because his in-laws go to the same church I go to. And so we may have actually seen each other in church, but we didn't know each other. But now that won't be the case. Our second pre presenter will be uh, Christopher Brooks. He's at uh, East um, Strasbourg University, and he'll be talking about on the pioneer African Americans in Abolition America, the case of John S. Rock. And though even though he's in a beautiful part of the country, lovely, I'm assuming it's not snowing there. No. <laughs> but in the and uh, in the valleys, what, what would you say? Was it the Poconos? Yeah, the Poconos. In the Pocono region, beautiful valleys. Beautiful leaves, beautiful yeah, foliage. It's very Although it's hardest in Frankfurt, though, if one yeah, can gather from the strange as that may sound. Here. Yes, as strange <laughs> as that may sound. Okay. And our final presenter will be uh, Marvin Kismer. He is a master's student in economics at the Fachhochschule in Flensburg, and he'll be talking about the Panic of 1857, Davenport's 48er, and the first global financial crisis. A very timely topic, if you will. Um, and Marv is also not new to the campus, he's been here before, and so he's almost become a regular here. So it's great to see him again, and I wouldn't be surprised if we'll see him again. Um, with that said, I turn it over then to Matt Lindemann, and uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, first of all, a few disclaimers. I am going to cover three biographies today. The first one is not related to the other two. I do think I can get them done in the 18 to 20 minutes. Uh, and secondly, the other two, the last two biographies, they are a married couple, but they were not really big fans of Carl Schurz, as it turns out, which will make things a little bit interesting. First biography, I actually wanted to look at the, the uh, concept of context, opportunity, and even personality with the 1848 revolutions and 1848ers over to America. So the first one takes me back to some of my dissertation work where I looked at the East Frisian immigrants that moved to America. Uh, located a great distance from the barricades of Paris, the Habsburg capital of Vienna, or even the German university town of Göttingen, where the students stirred the embers of revolution, East Friesland entered 1848 with a slate of geographical and class agendas. Behind the romantic vision of Frisian freedom, conveniently applicable for the time, two sets of goals underscored the essence of what 1848 and its opportunities meant to the East Friesland people. Enterprising merchants hoisted the tricolor flags in the cities of Emden, Deer, and Borden. Motivated by economic goals, there's the desire of German unification. On the other hand, distant markets, the possibility of German unification, or for that matter, discussions of basic freedoms, such as the right of free speech, political participation, meant little to the so-called primitive rebels of the rural villages, which interpreted 1848 in strictly social terms. Throughout the Hanoverian era, and this is where your map would come in very handy from Yogi's, Yogi's publication, um, you can see the predicament of East Friesland and the dominance of Prussia at the time. East Friesland is under the rule of Hanover. The merchants voiced their continual displeasure concerning their economic outlook vis-a-vis -vis the larger realm of European geopolitics. Mistrustful of possible encroachment of Prussian hegemony in northwest Germany, the Kingdom of Hanover countered the creation of the 1834 German Zollverein with a free trading zone of its own, one that linked Hanover with neighboring lands of Braunschweig, Oldenburg, and Schaumlippe. The new economic unions, the Zollverein and the Hanover Union, left Emden's merchants, or the merchants of East Friesland at large, out of the cold. If unification was not a possibility in 1848, the merchants at least saw 1848 as a chance to voice their concerns and demands to Ernst August, the king of Hanover. Nor is it worse than East Friesland, where the petitions pour in daily, the monarch groused on March 24. Three days later, he added, unfortunately, the atmosphere in East Friesland is the worst. The revolution, there's a strong possibility. After a long gestation of mounting grievances, the rural proletariat turned to open protest in East Friesland's March region, Marsh region during the spring of 1848. Concerned with the survival instinct, there's a mentality far away from St. Paul's Church. Instead of the political consciousness centered on representation, the Tagelmüller focused their efforts to improve their daily situations. 
In addition to protesting for higher wages, their petitions asked for reduced taxes and an exemption from the having to pay the school fees for their children. As one government official keenly observed, freedom from the press brings them no bread. While reporting on the social and living conditions in the March region, the nation rumbling of rural disturbances in early April, the same official noted that after rents were paid, little money remained for necessities such as fuel, food, drink, wash materials, and soap. In addition, doctor bills and medicine, along with school money and personal taxes, merely added to the already desperate situation. How they continue remains a mystery to me, wrote the official, hard pressed to offer an expedient solution. He declared, nothing short of intercolonization like they practice in Holland or migration to America will solve the problem. Before the report was officially filed, rural disturbances moved to a new level throughout the Marsh's Krumhorn region. On April 9, dozens of toggle owners gathered in Pusum, a small village, protesting the untimely dismissal of the threshing crew by locking the guilty employer in his house until he rehired the crew. A similar gathering occurred in the neighboring village of Brofusion, where the toggle lunar pressed for higher wages. A short distance to the north, the coastal village of Gritzel, the rural proletariat joined a number of sailors gathered with clubs and pitchforks knocking on the doors of wealthy farmers and other prominent, prominent citizens such as doctors, pharmacists, lawyers, and the like. They demanded money during their house colds, and they left a path of broken windows in their wake before finishing off the evening's festivities by burning a bridge in the outskirts of the village. Once the protests crossed the line of violence, however, authorities countered with stiff resistance, calling in the Burgerwehr to quell the situation. Beginning in April 10, dozens of arrests were made throughout the Krumhorn region of East Friesland. As a result, the violence along with the protests quickly dissipated. By the middle of April, officials reported calm had been restored to the area. Spontaneous, short in duration, local and unorganized, the small rebellions in the March region received little attention outside the immediate Krumhorn region. Aside from a small article in the most previous of Zeitung, and that's the version that was in uh, East Friesland at the time, uh, there is later a newspaper by that name in America published in Iowa. The disturbances went unreported to the press, underscoring the differences in the goals of the rural proletariat and the goals of the urban merchants of the East Friesland region. In contrast to the rural laborers, the marsh regions, which received little attention, the plight of the struggling colonists in the moor and the east regions of East Friesland received attention to the press during the spring and summer of 1848. And the East Friesland, um, the landscape, uh, sandy soil, but also marsh, even more marsh, um, the different regions within. Championing their cause and why the inner or more region receives more attention was the village schoolmaster, Heinrich Janssen Sunderman, first of the biographies I want to look at. Sunderman was pledged to school reform in rural villages of East Frisian countryside, and it began his pedagogical crusade one decade earlier by organizing the teacher for Ein in 1843, and following it up three years later with the formation of a pedagogical journal called the Lehrerschrift Wechsel, Teacher's Writing Exchange. His was a utopian outlook combining a mixture of school reform with Christian socialism and Frisian romantic traditionalism as professed through a concentration on Heimat Liebe, profession of love for one's homeland. Witnessing the world from the land and environment, his view left no room for the cities and their problems. For Sundermann, the East Frisian countryside represented the holy soil. In his opinion, reform or regeneration of society was best pursued through uplifting those closest to the soil, the rural inhabitants. Thus, he was angered when the urban schools continued to receive a disproportionate amount of funding and angered further as the colonist language of poverty that teetered on the brink of crisis. If one travels to the more countryside, he wrote in an 1848 newspaper article, one sees a house here, a hut there, further on the pole. The inhabitants know not of Sunday or holidays. One sees no churches. The children have no schools. The people live like the first inhabitants of the earth. To Sunderman, 1848 represented an opportunity to highlight the plight of the colonists while taking up the cudgel for social and pedagogical reform. He was given his platform early on in the Emden's liberal newspaper, the most Friedrich Zeitung, when they agreed to print his socially charged opinion articles throughout the year 1848. In addition, in 1848, he busied himself by founding three new journals to voice his concerns. Throughout the months of April and May, Sunderman, along with a number of other teachers, led gatherings of people's meetings, composed largely of the geese and more farmers. And at one such meeting, he waxed enthusiastically. What a time is now. There's never been so much important standing before us. Freedom, justice, truth. These words ring throughout the world. They are not just empty sounds. No, no. It is a reality. Brothers, let us celebrate that finally the day for humanity, for the people, for us is dawned. We celebrate the fact that finally the shackles of servitude are loosened. Finally, humanity is awakened from its sleep. 
Later in the year, he outlined a plan reminiscent of the French utopian socialists calling for a socially and economically cooperative Friesen mood to uplift the rural inhabitants. He uh, asked for this money or support from the king of Hanover, in other words, going to very conservative sources. Reality, however, quickly eclipsed his visions. Revolutionary interests gave way to the normal sum of work patterns that would soon have been with an incoherent vision without government support or financial backing. By the end of 1848, Sunderman's newly founded journals folded. He was left to ponder opportunities that migration might offer the poor. Rural inhabitants of East Friesland's East and North regions uh, uh, were uh, better off, he, he thought, by moving to America. And he started to found immigration or migration societies and started to become a broker for that particular uh, movement. Details of Heinrich Jans and Sunderman's activities during 1848 were included here not for the relative success or impact, arguably, he failed on both counts, rather as an illustrative case. This case argues 1848 represented a turning point or subtle shift in the area in reference to overseas migration. How bitterly ironic it must have been for someone who imbued the East Frisian countryside with a sense of religious purity and piety to speak of migration to a foreign soil. Sunderman himself did not make the voyage. Perhaps the step was too great. He's also um, jailed a number of times for speaking out. A number of acquaintances, however, attested the waters of migration becoming some of the first to send back the flow of in, uh, information in the form of letters. Outside the organizing people's meetings, Sunderman's circle of friends often met to ruminate the latest news from abroad. A diary recorded by an immigrant from an acquaintance group illuminates not only the importance of the information, but also the frustrations, trepidation, organization involved in the decision to immigrate. On March 14, 1851, the reported entry reads, Quote, in the evening, I went with Father Johann Harms to read the letter which he received from North America. This letter, like all news arriving from America, was a very cheerful one. Johann Weber and his wife agreed to immigrate, looking to the future. The day's entry concludes, it may well be that we will leave the enslaved Europe one day in order to breathe the free and noble North America. Months later, in 1851, on June 15 of 1851, the entry events further frustration, alluding to Sunderman's brief jail sentence as a result of a disagreement with Hessel's local pastor. The entry reads, in Germany things are getting much worse. He speaks a free true word, is sent to the gallows. All the great good and honest men of Germany who love the light and the truth are forced to leave their fatherland. And so on to quote from that. But um, I included Henry Jensen Sunderman here again uh, because one of the aspects that we haven't talked too much about is the concept of education. He founds all these pedagogical journals. We talk about liberty, but how much does education uh, play into the role of liberty as well? And looking to the poorer people, and giving them education. It's also an illustrative case uh, because of East Friesland's peculiar situation of being under the control of Hanover, uh, he looks to the conservative side of things for support and um, borrows some ideas from the French uh, utopian socialists. So he considers himself a moderatist or a rightist, and that's where he's going to get the support. When that fails and breaks down, he considers himself more of a leftist and looks to the immigration. Moreover, this is the deciding point between uh, the people in the lower rungs of society, the Tagalooner, and those running the show in East Friesland. Uh, afterwards, he's talked about the 1850s and into the 1860s as being decades in which the gulf between these two classes is irrevocably broken. Thus, the chain migrations continue to America. Uh, these people would settle in Illinois, uh, Iowa, Minnesota, the Dakotas, and into Nebraska. So quietly, and they're not known as sort of the legacy of the 48ers, but it's that 1848 revolution and how it was interpreted there that started the chain migration to these regions. The second two biographies, because I got a little bit greedy, I said, well, that's from my old dissertation work. But I'm living in Minnesota now, but in Winona, Minnesota, the Mississippi River. Uh, what's happening around Minnesota or neighboring state of Wisconsin? So I found a couple of biographies in the state of Wisconsin. The story wound up being too good not to include. Again, it fits with this idea of context and opportunity and even personality with the 1848ers and 1848 revolution. Uh, a web page that covers the 1848 revolution in uh, Europe has the following statement. With the revolution of 1848, there were men without partners, like the doctor and founder of the Kölner Arbeitsverein, Andreas Gottschalk, or others that went to battle for democracy and socialism with their wives, like Johanna and Gottfried Kinkel. Another strong pair came from the Westphalian region, Matilda and Fritz Anneke. And that's the pair that I want to look at in a little bit more detail in their biographies. 
The pair of the Anakis represent the second and third biographies, and as a married couple, their stories would logically flow together. You'd think that they would be together all the time as a married couple. So it turns out I might have to borrow a phrase from the previous presentation about alternative lifestyles uh, with this presentation as well. They were never together, as it turned out, once they married, or very seldom together. Both traveled uh, back and forth once they arrived in America and wound up living in a number of cities, uh, traveled back and forth across the Atlantic a number of times, and as I mentioned, they didn't manage to live together uh, very often during that entire time. This is very good for the historian because they're prolific letter writers, and the Wisconsin State Historical Society is full of their letters back and forth. They have commentaries of what's going on with um, the aftermath of the 1848 revolution. So first, Fritz. Fritz Anarchy's family is involved in mining, leading to a move to the rural region in the early 19th century. He was born in Dortmund in 1818, and although he experienced a rather distant relationship with his father, he was nurtured by his stepmother, and afforded the comforts of the status of a bourgeois upbringing. Anarchy became a Prussian artillery officer, but his sympathies for the poor and uh, socialist activities led to his dishonorable dismissal in the year 1846. The following year, he married Matilda, the couple took up residence in Köln, where she founded the Neue Kölnische Zeitung, and Fritz served as the co-editor. Using understandable language, the pair aimed to raise social and political consciousness among the working classes. The historian Theodore Hamro included Fritz in a select company of radical socialists who argued, quote, only with the masses of declassed masters and unemployed journeymen behind it could the political party achieve power during the revolution, unquote. Hamro pointed out, quote, the first to discover this were the radical socialists of the Rhineland, in vain did Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Andres Gottschalk, Karl Schopper, and Fritz Anneke seek to awaken the spirit of insurrection among the factory workers, the bearers of revolutionary tradition in France and England." Unquote. And so we have here one of the inner circle of Marx and Engels that gets out and lives in America and then deals with the legacy of these 48 years. So what does that look like? While the radical revolutionaries were sorting out their future, Fritz struck while the iron was hot, joining the insurgents in 1848. He fought in the Palatine, where Karl Schurz saved, uh, served as his aide on the battlefield. That's part of the personality conflict that will come into play. Wife Matilda's excellent horsemanship skills aided the cause and allowed her to be Fritz's orderly. She would later record her thoughts in a diary, which she um, published a number of years later. After the Baden uprising was crushed in the year 1849, Fritz and Matilda joined a number of other political refugees who immigrated to the United States. And Fritz was jailed for a time for one of those deals where Fritz goes to the United States and got jailed. Once on American soil, they were seldom in the same place as, at once, as mentioned, and tracing all of Fritz's movements would be beyond the scope of the presentation. Suffice it to say, he jumps around a lot, it's a restless soul. Non-compromising philosophy, a radical, uh, and has very much trouble adjusting to American institutions, and thus never settled down in one location. He gets kicked out of a lot of places. Working for numerous German language newspapers, lived in Milwaukee, Cincinnati, St. Louis, New York, New Jersey, among other places. He even spent time in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where his older brother, Emil, was getting famous auditor. Emil had a much easier time adjusting to American political life and institutions, helping found the Republican Party of Michigan, becoming the first Republican Auditor General in the state of Michigan. The attempt to set his brother Fritz up to study work, however, went for nothing, a squabbling between the brothers sent Fritz on the move once again. So by the year 1859, one of Matilda's letters showed her frustrations with Fritz's wanderlust ways. In a letter to him, she wrote, person like you, with whom chance is more in fight, I have not yet met. You are incessantly having a quarrel with him, and nowhere in life do you find the mathematical line so much advocated to you. It never happens as you calculated, and when it doesn't come, you are ill-humored, desperate, and tyrannical. By the early 1860s, Fritz moved to Europe, working particularly in Switzerland, as a correspondent for the German language newspapers. There he tried and failed to join the Italian revolutionary movement, led by Giuseppe Garibaldi, in uh, the year 1862, he returned again to America. In the meantime, when we get to Matilda's biography, she moves uh, over to Switzerland, but when she gets there, then Fritz moves back to America. So they live in the same place at once. He comes back to America during the Civil War and was given the command of the 34th Wisconsin Voluntary Infantry Regiment as a colonel. His uncompromising personality led to a conflict again and ultimately dismissal in 1863. He tried in vain to be reinstated, but was denied and forced to watch as many of his fellow 1848er revolutionaries found it easier to accommodate the military as an institution, took up leadership positions. Carl Schurz, Ludwig Blinker, Franz Siegel, Gustav Struve were among those that Anneke watched promoted to Union generals. This left a bitter taste in Fritz's mouth, something quite apparent in his letters back to Matilda. 
Amidst the war, in a letter dated December 15, 1863, Fritz wrote to Matilda lamenting the fact that fellow revolutionaries in Germany were also compromising their principles. He groused, my ex-friend Hamaker is, for aught I care, now a prominent representative of the bourgeois. Formerly, he was the exact opposite. Fritz seemed angry that Matilda still counted Hamaker as a friend. Matilda replied back that she was not impressed with success in and of itself, to the arguing over Hamaker being too successful and accommodating to the uh, German institutions over there. But she said, what does not impress me, dear Fritz, is when one has success in nothing. Just kind of stink to know that. Matilda's scorn was the least of Fritz's problems, however. Anarchy believed the Union Army was under wretched leadership, especially in Tennessee and Kentucky, where he served. Fritz blamed the administration and German-American Lincoln bootlickers like Schurz for allowing scoundrels and cheats to run the show on the battlefields. On April 19, 1864, he wrote, quote, The rebels are swarming through the whole district, driving out, hanging out, plundering Union men, gathering recruits, horses, mules, provender, etc. Are finally plundering Paducah, and have a whole regiment in Union City 10 miles from Columbus. And finally, they're capturing Fort Pillow, where they're massacring all the Negro soldiers and half the whites. For this, no one is to blame except our miserable, wretched, woodchopper administration, which thinks nothing but re-election and the pitiful high command of the army, under which honest men and capable officers are treated like criminals, that would be him, while scoundrels, thieves, arrogant blockheads, and idlers and flatters and lackeys flourish. One month later, he defined American freedom as liberty of rascality, thievery, and baseness. Fritz had little hope for revolution in Germany following the American Civil War, and yet continued to dream of the possibilities. In another letter, he wrote, perhaps there will be an opportunity for military activity for me over in Europe. If that is the case, I must be at hand. People of Europe will never be able to judge conditions here correctly. Would, moreover, if I return, perhaps look at me as one who has been ostracized. In order to maintain my social position, I would be obliged to resort to open conflicts, like duels and the like. As ready as I am, and often, as I have already made known, this readiness here among these civilized, thievish, hypocritical half-barbarians, readily beat each other with fists and clubs to settle disputes, I would nevertheless feel myself deeply humiliated in civilized Europe if I had to support my honor with a pistol or saber. Anarchy blamed, quote, big, unthinking masses who judge according to success, unquote, for his poor status and reputation. He did not have any success, uh, in other words, and that's what leads to a lot of his frustrations. Uh, to end Fritz's uh, story, uh, he comes back from the, the Civil War and, and throughout the rest of the 1860s, a um, number of newspapers that he works for again uh, and moves from city to city, winds up in Chicago working for the Deutsche Gesellschaft to help immigrants coming in. Gets into a fight with the Deutsche Gesellschaft co-leader who wants to move the whole uh, operation down to the south side of Chicago uh, and moves all the furniture to get away from Fritz quite literally. Uh, so he gets into a big fight there. Uh, that made all the German language newspapers in the area, again, uh, poor on his reputation. Uh, he gets very excited about reunification or unification possibilities in 1871. Even says Bismarck is now the guy. He's the only one that can stand up to Napoleon III. Uh, but does not live to see the growing pains of the newly unified Germany. Chicago had a great fire, as you know. Left a lot of destruction and holes in the city. And the nearsighted Fritz, perhaps one of the unluckiest 1848ers in all of our discussions, falls into a hole and dies. His wife Matilda, I'm going to wrap up real quick with Matilda's life, um, why she would be included here, uh, she never lived with Fritz, he's always on the move, he's um, trying to make money, little bits and pieces, like these newspaper articles, a number of other projects, as librarian, tries to work for his brother and so forth. Um, she predominantly lives in Milwaukee, uh, winds up opening a school there and becomes very involved in the women's rights movement. She was very inspired by the Christian Mott and others very early on. Uh, and she was the one that went out and dressed the German women, German-speaking women, with her speeches. They would have her on the national platforms of things. Uh, her correspondence is heavy with uh, letters back and forth with the Christian Mott, Susan B. Anthony and the like. Uh, she did take on uh, an alternate lifestyle, I think was the phrase used in the previous presentation. Uh, one of her uh, partners, she goes and lives in Switzerland for a time. They come back to America, um, and she, that, that partner dies, but then she winds up um, finding another woman partner, and um, very involved in the educational movement uh, for women and women's rights, and women predominantly have not been discussed in 1848 years as well, so there's a legacy of Matilda coming.
1848ers or any other immigrant can read our wants, desires, and notions of what is right in the world into. And I think that a lot of, again, a lot of the discussions over the course of the day, last uh, couple days have, or at least peripherally, if not directly, addressed that very point. Um, so as uh, Vitka in his 1948 article on the 48, or 48ers uh, uh, commented, complaining about the tobacco chewing uh, rednecks, and uh, I, th I think that there's really this, yeah, I think disillusionment really captures the sense. But in any event, I want to move on to the quote below. A German has only to be a German to be utterly opposed to slavery. Now, there's a number of uh, secondary sources, efforts, book, uh, Mishka Honig. A lot of people use this quote. Um, I'm not sure if you use it then or not in your book. Um, but I think that this speaks to the other perspective, the perspective that a very leading uh, abolitionist had of Germans. That this group, unlike the Irish, who would you know go on to literally lynch blacks in Central Park in, 19, in 1862, um, or church burnings in Philadelphia, and you know, all kinds of things of that nature. This was a group of, of upstanding people. These people were from their very core anti-slavery. So there was that perception. And then you can also get into Douglas's liaison with Hussey, but that's different subject. So this brings me to Heinz. Now I think that Heinz's views were, how shall we say, radical. Radical by anybody's estimation. I, I would venture to, in fact, a lot of source, secondary sources, and I'm sure, again, you all being experts are probably aware, um, He's seen as sort of a father figure of the concept of terrorism, of political terrorism, uh, which, again, we can perhaps get into later. Uh, <clears throat> were there similarities to him and John Brown? I would argue yes. Were they exactly the same? No, obviously because of their, uh, their backgrounds, the political situations, it would be totally inaccurate anachronistic and inaccurate to say they were exactly the same. But there certainly were similarities. In fact, um, this is kind of, uh, well, it kind of runs up to it. In 1859, in one issue of the Heinz uh, comments about uh, John Brown's raid and how excitedly happy he was. And this is going to be a martyr for the cause. Now these so-called Democrats realize what they have to do. And that was typical of Heinz. Um, oh, actually, let me take it for a minute. The, the Pionia, I'm going to skip the, a lot of the biographical stuff on Heinz because I don't think it's necessary for this audience. But uh, his second exile uh, may, is when Heinz makes his way back to the United States in 1850. One in, after be having been in prison. In 1853, he goes to Louisville, Kentucky, where he founded the Pioneer the newspaper, which he eventually moved to Boston in 1859. Um, it is worth noting, actually, a few more things on the radicalism of, of the radical views of Heitzen, or at least how some historians saw him. <clears throat> Benjamin Wolf Fitzgibbon commented, Heinzen does not simply want an unjust king to be killed and replaced. He wishes to see an entire system, and with it all those human beings who represent or who are involved in that system, completely wiped out. Why does this apply to the U.S.? You know, when he was applying this to 48 women. I think most tend to now agree that the 48ers felt short change. Again, I bring up that theme as Cardinal Kyle highlights in the opinions 
the opinions of those who actually fought in the revolution, like Heinz and Patton and Baden, in the case of the German states, public discussion quickly assigned to the American Revolution an idealistic and utopian quality, interpreting it as an ideological symbol of the universal aspirations of humanity and appropriating the new nation as the model for those in search of a better world. Which goes back to the theme I, or the point I raised at the beginning. And this led to, quote, a general and basically uncritical enthusiasm of what uh, von Reumann said was America's great democracy prevailed among radical Democrats as well as among liberals during the revolution of 48 to 49. This feeling of short change being short change in matters, uh, such in, this feeling short change in matters such as uh, ambivalence or weak resistance towards slavery um, provided that justification that Heinzen needed, at least in his eyes, to attack abolitionists. And we'll see how he does that in just a bit. But one thing that I think a lot of you may not be aware of is who this man is. Um, John Rock was born in a small village near Salem, New Jersey. Salem, New Jersey is in the, the actually southernmost portion of New Jersey. There's five counties in New Jersey below the Mason Dixon line. He was in one of them. It's right across the mouth of the Delaware River from the state of Delaware. Uh, he was born to a day laborer who was free. His mother had been free. Uh, turned out to be a rather precocious young man. By the age of 19, he was actually working as a school teacher and simultaneously studying medicine. He was refused admission to a Philadelphia Medical College, uh, turned to dentistry, had a pretty successful dentistry practice. In fact, he won an award um, for dentistry he created. He won a competition in Philadelphia at one juncture. And uh, subsequently, he finds his way into medical school. But that's after a long fight. But what's more important here, two things. First of all, where do his where does political views come? One. Two, where does this his becoming a lawyer come in? Play? And actually, the third thing, um, one of the things he was most famous for, Rock was very famous for the Lyceum speeches which he gave. So, <clears throat> first, the issues of his political views, in particular, his uh, sense of racial pride. His racial pride in entry into polit political and ethical debates on abolitionism first appeared. Um, as far as public records were concerned, in 1849, there was a, the so-called Negro Convention in Trenton, New Jersey, where he spoke on the topic of blacks losing faith in the system. Um, but to actually fully appreciate what he says, I think one needs to briefly, and I will keep this very brief, uh, take a look at what form those opinions and one of those things that formed his opinion was his involvement in at Mount Pisgah, the church that he attended, the one of the first African American Episcopal churches, or AME churches in the United States, established in 1816. First one having been established in Philadelphia after uh, uh, by Richard Allen. And um, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut that part out. But. Suffice it to say that the AME Church, in short, was created as a reaction to the control that was exhibited upon free blacks and their worship. Usually, the, well, the tradition was that uh, there would be a white minister who would sort of oversee, for lack of a better expression, pardon the pun, um, the black congregants. So, Allen and one of his uh, comrades, a guy named Absalom Jones, attended this service. They were asked to leave the uh, 
white section of the church who said, let us pray and we will bother you no more. They finished their prayers, they got up, they left the church and poured um, That's basically what happened. So this sense of sort of radicalism, and this is why I'm trying to connect, align the stars between rock and Heinz's, um, you see the connection, I think. In any event, um, after Rock presents uh, in New Jersey in 1849, speaking about how blacks had lost faith in New Jersey, they have no love for it because they felt cheated, um, 1850, he does finally get into medical college, before medical college in Philadelphia, um, two-year sort of vocational program, finishes in 1852, uh, in 1853, moves to Beacon Hill, Boston. And this is where um, he and Heinzen will eventually cross paths. Now, for those of you um, not familiar with Boston intelligentsia, some of you I know are, Beacon Hill was the uh, black section of Boston. Boston was seen, actually, to quote, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., the center of the solar system. So it was sort of seen as the heart of everything smart. And it, that, that rule didn't only apply to the Anglo-Americans, it also applied to the blacks who resided in the city. Uh, a lot of things were happening actually at that time. 1849, for example, very famous uh, Roberts case uh, where kind of challenged uh, racial segregation of schools in the city of Boston. Um, made it through the state courts. Uh, Charles Sumner, the famous Senator Charles Sumner, was the lead counsel on that case, uh, along with a guy named Robert Morris, who was one of the first, well, I think the third, perhaps only second, black lawyer in um, Massachusetts. So, and, and it turns out that actually Brock ends up studying law under Morris. But before I get to all of that, Rock also wrote for the North Star. And I think many of you are probably aware that the North Star was Frederick Douglass's newspaper. He was known for translating, for example, the goings on in Europe, in particular French. And Rock became, I would say, really a household name in the, in the area. Actually, in America, in particular black America. Most famously for one speech he had given in 1858 called, I Will Sing or Swim With My Race, uh, March 5th, 1858, which was known as Christmas Attic's Day. Um, at this, at this speech, they, it was a response to a series of speakers, uh, Wendell, uh, Wendell Phillips, Theodore Parker, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, Liberator, uh, were all present, uh, and Rock shared the platform with them. Rock began speaking about slavery and the behaviors of white Americans, and it's there that he actually establishes this concept of black is beautiful credited with it, and he, I'll give you part of the quote. I will not deny that I admire the talents and noble characters of many white men, but I cannot say that I am particularly pleased with their physical appearance. If old Mother Nature had held out as well as she commenced, we should probably have had fewer varieties in the races. When I contrast the fine, tough, muscular system of beautiful, rich color, the full, broad features <clears throat> and the gracefully frizzled hair of the Negro with the delicate physical organization, wand color, sharp features, and lank hair of the Caucasian. I am inclined to believe that when the white man was created, nature was pretty well exhausted. But determined to keep up appearances, she pinched up his features and did the best she could under the circumstances. Now, uh, pardon the expression, but that's not a set of balls. I don't know why it's. <laughs> pardon for being so crass, but I like. What? 
So, anyway. <laughs> Um, this led, of course, to laughter and mad applause, applause in the audience, uh, but <clears throat> the history-making resonance of the message was rather serious. Um, and I think it's something that should be kept in mind when we're looking at radicals reporting on radicals. Um, to continue, there's a couple snippets in the quote where Rock refused to quote, he, he was stated, used to feel degraded by being called a neighbor, proud. In his eyes, it was his, quote, duty, or I'm using his word, pleasure, and pride to focus his, quote, efforts in elevating to a fair position, a race to which I am especially identified by feelings and by blood. There was a very strong sense of racial pride here, which is extremely rare, well, heck now, even then. Um, just to give you a flavor of who John Rock was. So this um, speech really put Rock on the map, not that he wasn't already. Uh, Beacon Hill not only offered Rock a sound home for his anti-slavery advocacy, it also proved to be a place that fostered an appreciation for the law. There were very few African-American lawyers in the 19th, 19th century America. Rock became only the fourth in Massachusetts history. Considering that the number of African American attorneys was so small at this point in time, it should be a little surprise that Rock worked on abolitionist causes with the likes of George Ruffin and Robert Morris. Uh, Ruffin was a man who would eventually become a lawyer um, some years later, and Morris uh, provided the office where Rock did his legal apprenticeship. <clears throat> Rock was um, reported to have passed the bar in September of uh, 1861, only four years later, uh, of Massachusetts, Suffolk County, Massachusetts. Uh, actually, two, two weeks later, he's made Justice of the Peace. And as I explained in the very, at the outset, finding records is, I've only found snippets. But back to this work. Um, I think we need to take a look at how Heinzen actually discovers Rock. Um, the speech uh, that Rock had given at the State House in, uh, in Boston on March 29, 1860. Actually, it was a couple of years earlier, on the 28th. The articles from the 29th. And the article really jumped out at me for a number of reasons, which I will get into here. Um, the sort of strength that Heinzen uses to so let me rephrase that. The manner in which Heinzen uses Rock as an example of what's wrong with the abolitionist cause is very striking. Um, and as you can see here, Democratic, you know, Cottage is, of course, the so-called editorial quotation marks, the sort of cynicism. I won't even call it sarcasm, it's profound. I was just told I have two minutes, so I'm going to skip down to the nuts and bolts here. Um, he's praising him, because I only have two minutes, I'll make this quick, um, for being this thinking, educated uh, nega. Now, I think it's commonly accepted translation as Negro, but I want to that. I'm missing a slide for some reason. But in any of them, oh, there it is, down here. You can see down here, the uh, Democratic author, what do you, why aren't you pounding your fist? Why aren't they pounding their fists? Why aren't they supporting somebody like Rock 
if they're truly against slavery. But if we move back up in the text, and I'm missing the slide for some un unforeseen reason, um, you see the term nega translated as darky and as negro. And I think that speaks to the translation, the translation was done by the Liberator a few weeks after this article came out. And I think it also speaks to the almost hyperbolic utilization of a radical by Garrison, which I find very, I don't know, troublesome? Uh, Heinzen, I think Heinzen's words are strong enough in and of themselves to avoid mistranslating terms. But unfortunately, I'm out of time, and uh, perhaps I can get into that in the discussion. Thank you.
um, this um, result was a failure of banks and the crisis of the bank sector uh, then affected the real economy. In contrast to 1857, um, a bank run did not take place, and the consequences were more harmless than the pain. Um, if you see the debt in 80, the 1860s of the US, um, the government had an increase of debt um, by one third of total spent money, but in 2007, 2000, Line, it was only one fifth. So now, now we come to Davenport in Iowa. Um, like other regions in the Midwest, Davenport began to rise in the early 50s. Many factors had contributed to its economic upswing, not the least of which was the construction of a bridge across the Mississippi. The opening of that bridge in April 1956 by Rock Island Railroad Company connected with Chicago and Rock Island and Mississippi Missouri Railroads. This in turn connected Davenport directly to the east. As a result, Davenport's commerce was a longer, longer, almost solely dependent on the Mississippi River, and Davenport became a railroad hub. With this vital connection in place, the demand for housing, food, and supplies soared, touching up a boom in the local economy. In 1857 alone, 1,250 houses and buildings were erected in Davenport. The population increased from 1,848 in 1850 to almost 50,000 in 1957. This is the first. Uh, in yeah. um, hundreds of houses were built in a few months, where before there had been nothing but naked prairie, and the number of palatial homes for the city's economic and the political power brokers were built in an, in an elite neighborhood northeast of the downtown area. New businesses of all stripes appeared in the commercial district. Old frame structures were taken down or re removed to more distant locations and replaced by with substantial brick buildings some three or four stories high. Only from 1956 through 1957, four miles of streets in the lower part of the city were upgraded, <coughs> almost 20 miles of so the sidewalks were laid, the network of gas pipes was extended. 250 street lamps were erected, two sewers were installed, and a new fire station was built and fully equipped. Um, with a booming population and increased demand for goods and services, the demand for money was also great. Money could be borrowed by anyone who could give good security and was willing to pay high rate of interest. When Theodor Olshausen, former leading 48er from Kiel, Schleswig-Holstein, moved to Davenport. Uh, he borrowed uh, $1,000 with an interest rate of 10% to buy the German-American newspaper, the Demokrat. But 20-25% uh, rates were an income, and when the money was used most judiciously for real improvements, its cost wasn't considered unreasonable. Um, yeah. Scott County's farmer uh, were also experienced the best of times of the years 1854 to 1856, often referred to as the golden days. Prices for agricultural products, as well boosted by exports, the price of bushel potatoes was about $1.25 to $1.50. Uh, this would be in, in flotation adjusted um, $30 today. So, and a fish, physician like Johannes, a friend of 48 hours, had an income of $100 in 1857. Uh, this would be uh, $9,700 today.
unfortunately, they, what's called economic days, would soon undergo a pronounced and prolonged change. By the end of summer in 1857, storm clouds began gathering over the business interests of the entire country. Chief among the causes of the resulting panic of 1857 was the lack of a national currency. This resulted in a myriad of banks throughout the country issuing their own paper money, which was often printed without the backing of sufficient reserves. Uh, I, the Iowa law didn't permit banks to locate, locate it within the borders to issue their own money, but a local Davenport bank uh, sidestepped this law by printing their own money in the Nebraska territory. This was called uh, called uh, uh, Florence money. This is uh, the one dollar note. Uh, the panic of 1957 was first felt in the uh, cessation of the Eastern Capital investments and the demand for return of advance already made. Davenport's merchants and investors who relied on the capital and credit were stretched to their credit limits and deep in debt. Gold and silver circulating in the West was quickly snapped up and sent and to the East to meet obligations. Result were decreased consumer demand, depressed sales, lower prices, reduced, reduced uh, incentives to produce or invest and increased unemployment. Profits, land, values and develop, development all stagnated, making it harder and harder and harder for all to pay their debts. This financial situation was exacerbated when 1858 proved to be a disastrous year for Scott County Harvest. Because of heavy and frequent rainfall during the harvest session, the wheat crop was insufficient to provide seed for the following season. The comparatively small quantity that was market sold at no more than uh, 50 cents per bushel for wheat and five cents per bushel for potatoes. Uh, the heavy rains uh, wrecked even more havoc on the barley crop, causing prices to plumb to no more than 20 cents per bushel for wheat. To make matters even worse, the year's corn crop was an almost total loss because of the several frost in early September. After the three golden years, this, this turn of events was a bitter disappointment for Scott County farmers. Unfortunately, insistent rains during the following two years only added insult to injury. The farmers most affected storekeepers, collections, foods preventing payments to wholesalers and manufacturers, which in turn made it difficult to these entities to keep current with their creditors. <coughs> when 20 person rates were uncommon, now 30 to 50 Person credits became normal. Today, uh, in the crisis in 2010, you could borrow money in Europe for 6% if the same amount. Uh, the panic led to a public shutdown. Basic services such as police and fire protection were suspended. Many farmers would borrow money to improve their farms, couldn't pay the interest on the loans secured by their property. Uh, they are losing both farms and kicked off their homes. The walls at the entrance of the courthouse were plastered with notice of the shared sales. The newspapers were filled with such public announcements. Wages were reduced to half a dollar a day, but many still couldn't find work. The population which had reached 6,677 by March of 1858 uh, dropped to 11,000 by 1860, and not until the 1870s the population resolved. Seven to 
1859. Was the price paid by farmer from Davenport $20 per acre in 1858? He could, could not sell it for $10 in 1859. All of those develop, uh, developments placed a heavy, heavy strain on Cook and Sargent. The bank whose business was greater than all of Davenport's other banks combined. Making matters worse were the actions taken by Austin Corbin, the former business partner of 48 a member of the first German Democratic Parliament, uh, uh, Paul Church in Frankfurt, Hans Reimer Clausen in one of the principals of the Davenport Banking House of Macbeth and Corbin, a bank which assumed no currency of its own. Uh, relentless pressure resulted in ever widening cracks in Cook and Sargent's Marble Bank. The long period final pressure arrived on December 1859, also called the Black Friday, when many surprised and shocked David Paul others learned Cook and Sargent's doors had opened that morning. By fools, some hope the suspicion would be temporary, but didn't prove to be the case. Large and small businessmen, farmers, and laborers who had the Deposits in the Bank of Florence money, the possession suffered heavy losses. Like Cook and Sargent, the formerly successful firm of Burroughs and Prettyman was driven into bankruptcy. This was a uh, money issued by the this bank, Prettyman. Um, I fool the panic of 1857 brought financial ruin to many of our young cities in the West Davenport was able to recoup and pass through the body compar comparatively well. Nevertheless, the food, the failure of Copen Sargent represented below watermark in Davenport's financial struggles. The well of prosperity was replenished only gradually. Money continued to be rarely and more poor weather continued to shrink from the front line. After the panic of 1857, after the resolving during the crisis and the deflation in 1858, the economy started again in the 1860s, shortly before the American Civil War. What former leading Schleswig Holstein 48 at Theodor Holzhausen had to move away, he sold his German name for the newspaper, the Demokrat, and moved to St. Louis. He started again with the newspaper, Westliche Post. He stayed in Davenport from 1856 to 1860. Also, uh, Davenport was declared to be Iowa's first military headquarters, was before the Civil War started, and uh, this was a chance to um, boost the economy again.
Good thing I'm really retentive. Okay, let's start with questions and Daniel Malibu. Thank you. Um, I have questions for everyone, but I want to start with Matthew Linden and maybe. Um, are you familiar with Misha Honeck's work? Misha Honeck, uh, he's a uh, fellow at the German Historical Institute, he pub has published a book that belongs to these recent books about the 48 ers um, uh, uh, It's called We Are the Revolutionists, and he, he has a very big chapter in that book on the Amicus and the breakdown of their marriage, basically, which I think can be connected, and I think he connects that, if I remember it correctly, to the death of their children due to smallpox. Um, and, um, and Matilda blames um, Fritz for not having them um, back recognized. Yeah, yeah. and um, as you know, that, and, and the marriage basically breaks down from then on, and they basically live separate lives, still in contact, still talking to each other, but not really close anymore. Um, so if you if you're interested, you should really check this out if you don't know that because that basically is is a, the most detailed analysis I think um, of the of the Anikas who are really interesting and really tragic as you said I mean that their lives I mean especially Fritz's lives life is very tragic and full of failure in America. Um, I, yes, I definitely like to get that name. I think what you're speaking to there is the these people have personal lives. Mm -hmm. All these 40 years have personal lives. We talk about these big, large mm -hmm. ideas over the top of things, and then there's personalities and personal lives that are part of this as well. Did you, did you want to yeah, but, but we can switch off. Okay. okay. Come back later. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, my, my first query is uh, going to Christopher. Um, once more, I estimate John Rock as a very, very uh, wonderful man with a of sure, of course, totally honorable personality. Um, and you spoke also about Heinzen. Heinzen, I guess, was really a charismatic man with ideas and with uh, things he did, which have been uh, going to the future. Um, could you anything say, say about other black people surrounding Heinzen? Uh, some information, some names, more? What I can say, I don't no specific people around him. What I can say is that Heinzen was trying to actually, actually Daniel and I were talking about this yesterday, um, unlike seeing blacks as this, oh, that group, we feel bad for them, they have personal lives. Mm -hmm. And we're inviting these people to be part of their personal lives. Um, I was thinking of the Asing, and really Heinzen is one of the two of the few um, 48ers who didn't really adhere to the otherness or have sort of the really strong anti-black uh, feelings like Struba did. Um, so I, I don't know all of like his circle. I do know that um, Heinzen was a rather obstinate man and very difficult to get along with, so I wouldn't think that he was the kind of guy you want to hang around with a stumpfish, if, it, if you know what I mean. He might, he might you know, pull out a sword or something. <laughs> only if you agree with him. You, you only want to hang around if you say yes to everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, <sir>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thanks. I'll like to follow up on that a little bit. That move, Heinzen's move to or to uh, Boston uh, and some 48er relationships to the East Coast. Uh, we have a closer tie to New York. You know, we have Carl Schwartz in New York, but this was a move to Boston. And I wonder if you could, ex if, if you could say more about that choice, because well, for both Rock and Einstein, that that would be the meeting place. It's not only Beacon Hill, but it's also Harvard and Cambridge. And it's also the older tradition of Germans coming to the East Coast, the intellectual center, and it is Massachusetts. And I think, yeah, I was going to say that really the, um, actually, I think uh, General Gage's comment going back to the American Revolution about Boston and these rats. And, uh, Bostonians were always seen, seen as the rabble rousers. And 
I think that during the abolitionist movement, and I think a lot of it has to do with Charles Sumner's presence, that and the garrison um, played a role in supporting or sort of um, nourishing that uh, milieu of uh, radicalism, or even if we don't want to call radicalism, certainly to strong anti-Southern uh, mentality. And I think it was attractive, very attractive, to people like Heinzey who wanted to be heard. Um, you know, sort of the guy you know, pounding his fist, pounding his foot, stamping his foot, screaming and yelling. Um, and I think for Rock, and this is part of it that I had to leave out, uh, he had actually gone to France uh, to because of an illness which very unclear as to what it was, but it prevented him from practicing medicine anymore, which is what led him to study law. Uh, that was the switch. He was over in France for about half a year, and that's where the little and the Stade, and these references are made in the article uh, that I have. He's talking about that um, in the anti-Napoleonic sort of sentimentality that he brought back with him. Um, which is what struck Heinzen to write the article in the first place. Oh my goodness, he knows about us. He's one of us and feeling that sort of camaraderie. But I think that Boston just was, you know, in the quirky sense, very much the center of progressivism in America. And actually, one could even argue it still is. Yeah. Can, I can I follow up on that question by Carl Fink? Sure, that's fine. Um, because Professor Fink, um, Karl Heinz, um, <laughs> is uh, actually, he, he lives in New York City in 1848 when the revolution breaks out. He goes back to Germany, basically had, leaves no impression there, goes back to New York City, founds three newspapers in a row, they all fail. He goes to Louisville, Kentucky, founds the um, Herold des Westens at first, and then the second newspaper is the Pioneer, and that to that their Pioneer, <laughs> and then and he goes, he wants to go back to the East Coast. He ends up in Cincinnati where his money runs out, so he has to wait. A friend of his finances the move to New York City, and he's back in New York City. And in New York City is his greatest enemy, the New Yorker Staatszeitung, the Democratic newspaper of New York. New York City is totally dominated by the Democratic Party. The Republican 48ers, as much as they try, they never get a hold of the people. They are all voting for the Democrats. Very, very Jacksonian. Very Jacksonian, and really, and also he has this really long standing. I mean, in that little snippet, I love that because um, he said basically, um, uh, yeah, the Democratic editors of the New York Stadt side, they would, they would, they would be a surprise because they're so racist. They would be surprised to hear black men speak. Uh, uh, is that the one you're referring to where you call them pumpkin heads? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then that, that would be, that would be shocking for any, uh, any democratic, uh, uh, editor of a democratic newspaper. And so, uh, I don't, but uh, he, he stays in New York City for several years and then decides to move to Boston which is a really interesting and strange decision because no 48er goes to New England. Very few, except for Heinz. And so he really is different in a, in, in a way that he looks for the uh, context because he's so isolated among the Germans because he's such an unpleasant personality and he's really aggressive and he attacks people and, and friendships break up quite easily if you disagree with him politically. And it's very easy to disagree with him politically. And so he goes to, to, the, to Boston and he befriends Afro-Americans and also abolitionists. And, they, they form, and he's more uh, friendly towards them than to his fellow Germans. I think that this is uh, actually, I would say that um, Heinzen's failures in New York stem largely, uh, and I think we would agree, are based largely on his political stance of being so unbending, uh, he had no chance. If he had been more of a moderate, he probably would have still been in New York, but then again, we may not have ever heard of him. And I, and I think that Boston provided an opportunity for him that he saw that a lot of other 
leaders had, and I'm surprised, and this might be somebody in the room to do a study on, um, why not Boston, considering everything that was going on there? Sorry. Can I respond to that then? Because I spoke Great, about that. I want to expand the conversation. So, but, but I think I need to answer that. Okay. Because yesterday I spoke to that. That's the young Deutschner that Peter Matthews spoke to him about in the last session. That the, the young Deutschner, those people, and, and uh, Karl from Karl Fon, uh, Giesen, the Giesen founder of the, uh, of the Giesen Blacks, the most radical movement, he had to leave, as a dissident of the state, he had to leave in 1824, and he came to Boston, Cambridge, and then he gave, in 1834, the first lecture of the Boston, um, or of the New England Anti-Slavery Convention in 1834, as Douglas was emerging, and then Douglas gave some of the speech 1849. But this was already the Harvard, the Harvard uh, Center for uh, Germans, radicals. And they were gravitating in Boston. Which is very curious to see that a lot of blacks, um, I think, uh, Martin Delaney, <coughs> who was accepted to uh, study medicine, but in three others, who were accepted to study medicine at Harvard and were basically chased out. Um, Delaney ended up studying medicine in Glasgow, coming back to the United States, and developing a plot to outbid the southern states in cotton by buying up land in uh, what is now Nigeria. But that's a this, this, this would be great. But we can talk later. Let's have it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I have a comment and a question for uh, Marvin. The uh, comment is uh, I think you did a tremendous job with a very involved economic explanation, but the implicit comparison with 2007-2008 was, was really good. I have a factual question, though. <clears throat> On one of your earlier slides, you referred to uh, Dr. Johannes making $400 a year. I'm just curious to know a little bit more about this position. I had the same question the month here. Or I think you just put the, the income in and then it adjusts for inflation and then right. you put the year in. Right. I'm, I'm curious about the position. What is his last name? So, uh, oh, Johannes Olshausen. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Say that again. Uh, Johannes Olshausen, uh, physician, is half brother of Theodor Olshausen, this mm -hmm. famous publisher and so on. It, exactly, money and, and, and uh, the social situation also. Uh, in 1989, behind the Iron Curtain in Merseburg, we found letters from Theodor Olshausen, Devonport, April 18, 1858, sort of in the center of the panic of 1857. And he's writing to his older brother, Justus, wir sind hier sozusagen ohne Geld in Devonport. Alles Papiergeld bis auf fünf Centstücke herunter und noch ohne Aussicht, dass wieder solches hierher fließt. Denn die landwirtschaftlichen Produkte, die Devonport den Wohlstand bringen sollen, sind zu sagen wertlos. Die Preise decken lange nicht die Produktionskosten. Die Kartoffeln gelten zum Beispiel augenblicklich per Buschel fünf Cent, während diese Quantität im Winter vorher 1857, 1,25 Dollar, 1,40 Dollar galt. Die Farmer können deshalb nicht bezahlen und alle Geschäfte stocken. Was man deshalb hier viel herbeisehen hört, 
ist ein großer europäischer Krieg, der die Getreidepreise hebt. Ob ihr, Justus, Europa, Lust habt, einen solchen Krieg zu machen, um unserer Bedrängnis zu Hilfe zu kommen, weiß ich nicht. Well, um, just... That was a dark moment. It was a dark moment, but uh, I think this is a wonderful first-hand um, statement out of this panic of 1857 that the potato prices dropped from $1.40 to $0.05 cents a bushel. So they were just desperate. And he is explaining that Davenport, the situation in Davenport was even better than many other upper and Midwest cities. So the crisis must have been devastating. What's interesting is the accusations he makes against yeah. Germany at the time. Because what they're willing to pay in terms of that international market for American goods. Yes. And then even like um, asking or hoping for a European war to help the financial crisis in Devonport. I think that's what a concept. Yeah. How do you respond to an international crisis when people don't really think necessarily in international terms. They do, but they don't. And so but I think it's much more national. But uh, to, as a conclusion, isn't it surprising how this 1857, where we think, well, no mass communication and, and so on, looks so similar to what we know, mm -hmm. and that wars are always a solution for economic challenges. Right. Klaus. And this is a great problem, I guess, of the 48 of thinking, of, of the kind of thinking, the nationality thinking, and uh, up to these moments. Um, I'm a fan of Theodore Hoetzhausen, but this was, this was really tough. a heavy, tough, dark moment. I don't like it. Okay, but nevertheless, um, 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 query to, to uh, Mavi. Uh, I guess uh, in Davenport the situation was as we have heard it, and uh, step by step they. The 48ers tried to work against the running out money and the catastrophe. And so, uh, step by step, step uh, they have been successful at the end, um, rebuilding a mill or something else. Um, did you anything find uh, as a literary conception of 48ers? thinking against crisis, like Karl Marx with his ecumenical volume in Europe, in a small volume, in a small size. What, what, what is your question? My question is, uh, had they any literary, con uh, did, did they concepts, write concepts. any concepts against ecumenical problems? Or did they only react and only work against? Oberzhausen and then um, Heimer Clausen. Um, the later letters were only write about the slavery and the civil war. It was nearly forgotten the panic of 1857. Yeah. And the huge amount of debt wasn't important anymore. And the con conflict between northern, northern states and the southern states uh, increased because of that, because the southern state wasn't infected of the crimes that the northern and the best states. So we could say the war came not in Europe, the war came in America. Yes. No? Okay. No, 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 the, the, the Crimean War invites a lot of these discussions. Right. And there's right. a lot of literature on the Crimean War, with the Russians, with the Western powers involved in this, the huge Turkish empire that everybody turned against. Right. So that's a big topic here and was very relevant, I think. More questions. I would like to invite one for Matt. I don't think they're collected at all. Does I just have a very brief question here. Uh, Madame de Stahl was mentioned. Mm. And I never heard her in context of here. I'm sorry. I, I, Madame de Stahl, you mentioned it still? Yeah, just yeah. I mean, I read about Germany and romanticism and stuff. I never heard her in connection with anything here. Mm. What, have you read something by her? That I actually, that's next step because um, that's the next step in the project to start digging through this primary source. And really this article is actually blossoming into something on its own. Um, I was working on Rockwood because I was getting bored of working on one language. I think the project do this anyway. But um, I, when, I, when I saw that 
Uh, well, I'm presuming that he had read her during his journey to Europe when he was for his illness. Uh, but that's the other thing, uh, looking for records of his time um, when he was under the uh, care of uh, Dr. Neil Pont in, in France. So he was very well. It's so interesting to me because I am, you know, in connection with Germany, mm. intellectual movements, romanticism, mm. which is one of the grand sources, a connection. I think, I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that the, the sense of anti Napoleonism so is yeah, 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 that it's sense. And her speaking against it as a woman, um, very attractive, obviously, to Heinz, and also very attractive as a resource for Rock to indicate what culture, to demonstrate that he was cultured in the sense that his audience would perceive as culture. That being, you know, members of the uh, Massachusetts House. Well, I'm speaking of urgent liberty within this 1848 context, there is a national companion with romanticism that hasn't been brought up to my side. I'm curious, I'm going to use my position as moderator to get my question. Um, well, I'm curious, but we didn't get to hear much about Matilda. Now, did gender play a difference in her role? We've heard largely, almost exclusively, about men, or groups dominated by men. And so we don't really have any female voices. So is, is she similar to all the other men in her activities, or does the fact that she's a woman make any difference? I think she gravitates quite early to the women's movement within America. And okay. Just builds up from there locally, and they start raising funds for her to attend regional and national conferences. That becomes her go-to network, as opposed to maybe some of the other issues. The first, first card that she put down. But it still is this idea of participation in democracy, though. Yeah. So it's still some of the very themes and values. It's funny because my question, Matt, was related to that, and I was going to see for after, but if I have time, um, did Matilda experience? As I was listening to you speak, I was thinking about my own paper and this sense of this whole sense of disillusion that the last four years. Did she feel that when she was interacting with feminists, American feminists, or did she feel just part of the movement? Or did she feel a little, did, she, did you get a sense that a she A little bit it? because she is still speaking in the German language, whereas they're speaking in the English language. Um, some of them are a couple of generations ahead of her. She refers to the Christian Hotley later as she's one step towards the grave, and so she's kind of up the next generation that's going to come through. Uh, a lot of correspondence with Susan B. Anthony, and Susan B. Anthony shooting down a lot of her ideas sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, she, Matilda comes up with the idea there is a disconnect. on the 100 year anniversary to have a 3 million person petition. And Susan B. Anthony uh, is like, well, if we do this and get a couple hundred thousand, it's going to look terrible, and I just don't have. Susan B. Anthony said, I don't have faith in the American women to sign their names to this pledge. She's a little bit more enthusiastic than Susan B. Anthony was at that time, than Susan B. Anthony kept shooting down. So this speaks to what I was saying about reading expectations into the top of Rasa, which was America. Yes. That's what she was doing. So, oh, there we go. Can I pick up on the uh, kind of women's suffrage? Um, that was important, Matilda. I think we heard yesterday, wasn't it Hedda, that had a debate against women's suffrage? How did that? Interact. How was that interaction between the 48ers on women's suffrage, both those in favor and those opposed? Uh, mo most don't bring it up or are opposed. Um, this is a connection to Heinzen. The Anarchies will actually praise Heinzen for being sort of fellow radical, but also being one of the only ones that brings up some of the women's issues in his German language papers. So they're in the definite minority of that, that area. But suffrage, suffrage spent connection between women and Frederick Douglass, isn't that where it came together or around 18? Well, yeah, because Douglass is the new woman, right? I don't know what the new woman is. Well, I can... Go, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, Douglass is one of the few abolitionists who actually show up at Senate Falls. So, yeah, there was just clearly a connection. He, he was definitely far more say, egalitarian when it came to women uh, than other abolitionists. That older generation of English-speaking women came out of the abolitionist movement. There's definitely 
architecture. It's that one of Matilda's partners, Mary Booth, her husband, Sherman Booth, was an abolitionist, but didn't treat women very well. They didn't the women their sense of liberties. And so uh, Matilda took care of Mary. Uh, Sherman certainly wasn't. Sherman was brought up with all kinds of charges of licentious behavior and everything else. Anybody else have a question? Let, let me get someone we haven't heard from. No question to Christopher. You've, uh, you've talked a lot about the influence uh, on evolution of Germans also. Um, is there any big impact of, of, of British people? I mean, in the 1830s, this, this has been probably one of the most important issues in British politics and the British Empire. What about slavery? So, did they influence the debate in America? And, and others. Um, and also the fact that uh, by the 1850s, the number of uh, uh, churches, and, uh, sort of, uh, well, mostly it was churches, uh, but also workers uh, would invite abolitionists. They wanted black abolitionists. Uh, Douglas was a very hot ticket. Uh, throughout um, parts of Scotland, the Manchester, Liverpool sort of corridor there, um, really even in the Midlands, of England, um, very popular. Uh, there was an incident where, um, if I recall correctly, was a Calhoun had been invited to, in his capacity, cabinet to come to Britain, and he was publicly ostracized for uh, his position on slavery by the Brits. And why don't we also allow this, you know, it was Martin Delaney who was the person who was on the legislative meeting, and it was at the same meeting. Was, uh, uh, really radical South Carolinian was invited to. So I think that Britain does play a tremendous role, in particular for fundraising. Um, there was a lot of this feeling that the worker in Britain was equal to, or similar to at the very least, in plight to the slaves, or even worse, than the slave situation in America. And that caused other problems, and a fallout between uh, Douglas and Garrison, which I won't get into here, it's too far removed. But, yeah, definitely. Um, what would be interesting to look at, now that you bring it up, would be sort of looking at how the British and German views have the similarities and likenesses there. Um, that would actually be something definitely worth looking at. Yeah, my question is about, we've... Um, yeah, this is going to be our last question. Yes. So make it a really, really good one. Powerful, this is a powerful, powerful abstract question. What happened afterwards with John Locke and Karl Heinz after that? Period? To the best of my knowledge, nothing other than the fact that uh, Rock, well, as you know, Heinz didn't, Heinz didn't sell a lot of papers, which is why he was broke so many times. Actually, throughout his entire life, he was broke. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't need to tell you that. You've written more about it than I have. Um, so I, I think that so I guess the question is, did they meet? Yeah, I've yeah. seen no record of that. But the problem is, here's the difficult thing, and this is one of the difficult things about a lot of African American research on 19th century African Americans. I was speaking with somebody who's actually in the other session about this now. Um, records are so sparse. His personal papers, here's what happened. Okay, Rock, his, his wife, died of tuberculosis. Then he died of tuberculosis. Ten years later, all of his belongings were willed, I read his will, to his mother and his, actually mother-in-law and son. They both died in the same year, in 1867, or 77, sorry, 1877. So, where are the records? Nobody knows. So yeah, it's been a lot, there's been a lot of digging. I've done some digging. I've found some pieces, but to answer that question, 
would be an interesting one to answer, but I haven't seen any record of any correspondence between the two men. Only because he did a wonderful <laughs> blessing last week. We're going to ask one tiny question. It's only a joke full command. Oh, oh, to Mathilde Emicke. <laughs> Mathilde Emicke came from Dortmund, and uh, uh, the German men who made the experience with a Westphalian girl used to say, happy, no, Dortmund is not fine, Westphalia today, is Westphalian, she was a Westphalian girl, happy are those whose hand holds a hand of a Westphalian girl. <laughs> Glücklich, wessen Hand umspannt ein Mädel aus Westfalenland. That's right. Matilda Anneke. Matilda Anneke. <laughs> On that happy note, the pleasurable note, stimulating paper, stimulating engaging conversation. Stimulating moderator. Good luck.